So our next speaker is Dr. Arun Sayal. Dr. Hi. Sayal is an emergency physician who also runs the Minor Fracture Clinic at North York Hospital in Toronto. Mm -hmm. He had created and teaches the CASTED course that's been running twice at this conference and also had the, received the award for the CFPC 2011 Continue Professional Development Award. I'd like to doc thank Dr. Sayal and hand it over to him now. Is it on? There go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the, the invite very much, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you to Rob. Uh, special thanks to Sandy, who does a great job uh, of organizing the conference. Uh, so thank you very much to be here. It truly is an honor to be able to be out here and talk to you folks about dislocations. The title may be a bit of a misnomer. It's not dislocations made easy, but hopefully it'll make them a little easier. Sometimes dislocations are difficult. So not all of them are going to be easy. Uh, sorry, let me see why this isn't advancing. Um, work downstairs. Oh, there. So it's changing on my screen. It's not changing on yours, buddy. Uh, no, we're good. There we go. Now we're good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, conflicts, none, none with farm or industry. I, I am the creator and the director of uh, the CASTED course. Uh, this is North York General Hospital. It's a wonderful community hospital where I've worked. I trained there and I've only worked there as a staff doctor. It's the only place I've ever worked. Great community hospital, lons, uh, tons of adults, tons of kids. Since 93, I've been an eMERGE doc, 15, 20 shifts a month for years. And then in about 12 years ago, the orthopods asked me to run a minor fracture clinic. All these little pearls of ortho are sitting between the ears of the orthopods. You just need to get to know them. You just need to chat with them. When you're a resident, you've got to spend time in the OR because that's where they'll be able to teach you. They can't teach you in one line in the fracture clinic, one line in the emergency department. Uh, I'm very grateful to these nine orthopods who I work with. They're very generous to let me see their easy cases. They're very generous to teach me tons. And hopefully over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll be able to share some of their pearls. Cases. I always love showing cases. So just think of how you would manage these coming up. Think of if you, if you would x-ray them beforehand. So how many of you, in the middle of the night, if you, if you work in eMERGE, you have to call x-ray in? Yeah, a number of you. So you may reduce these without an x-ray, perhaps, and sort of see. Think of if you would reduce them or not, would you be comfortable doing it? Why are you reducing it? Instead of just memorizing, like somebody said, I should do it, if you understand why you're doing it, it'll guide you the next time you're faced with the question, as opposed to just memorizing it. Think of the techniques you'll use. There are various techniques that can aid in the reduction. What are you going to do afterwards? How do you immobilize them? And then follow up. Who do you send them to? So again, just with a show of hands, if you're going to send somebody to orthopedics, how many people, when you send them to ortho, they have to, the patients have to travel to another facility, hospital, whatever? Right. So a lot of things get managed locally. A lot of things you need to ship out, you need to kind of decide. You don't want patients to go 400 kilometers to find out that's like, okay, it's something you could have managed locally. Similarly, you don't want to manage something locally that turns out it's more serious. So, case one, 28-year-old playing soccer, injures his finger, comes to you and emerge. Just think of if you would do an x-ray pre-reduction. If you saw this guy in the soccer field, who would give it a shot and try to reduce it? Yeah, I'd give it a shot. If I didn't get it, I didn't get it, but I'd give it a shot, right? And sort of see, if I work in emerge, I work in emerge where I have x-ray 24-7. So if I see this guy, I'll put a block in him, I'll go, something's wrong, and I'll send him for x-ray. But if it's 3 in the morning and I don't have x-ray, I'm not going to call them in. I'll just give it a shot and take an x-ray afterwards. We'll talk about how to reduce what to do. Case 2. This is a 22-year-old guy who injures his finger. He also has a dislocated PIP. Take a look at this and think of how you'd manage this. What would you do afterwards? How would you immobilize it? Who would you send it to? Case three, 18 year old kid playing hockey, knees a bit flexed, he turns in, patella pops out, very common, right? Most of the time you see this, you can do it without an x-ray. It's pretty obvious they have a patellar dislocation. The kid's been looking at his patella off in right field here for the last half hour, right? Most of the time you can reduce this without sedation. We'll show you little tricks on how to do it. 
Who needs an x-ray before? Who needs an x-ray after? We'll talk about that. These are all cases from our hospital. 45-year-old guy, what happened to him? Playing soccer, he injures his ankle. This guy's got stretching of his skin on the medial side. If you wait four or five hours for x-ray to come in to reduce it, this may become secondarily opened. So you decide how you want to do this. Do you really need an x-ray to say something's wrong with this guy's leg? Like, probably not, right? Case five. Okay, 38-year-old, I think it says. 38-year-old who slipped off a couple of steps, injured his ankle. It shifted a little bit. It subluxed. Think of a few would reduce this and emerge. Would you feel comfortable doing it? Easy to do? How would you do it? So for principles, a few things. You want to promptly reduce these for many reasons. But prompt reduction also requires recognition. And the problem is sometimes we don't recognize when joints are out of position. And if joints are out of position, they shouldn't leave your eMERGE department. This is a 15-year-old kid comes back to see me in the minor fracture clinic. He comes to the hospital five days after injury. X-rays are done, diagnosed with an ulnar styloid fracture. Follow-up in the minor fracture clinic comes back to see me eight days later and his distal ulna is out. He has a drudge dislocation. He's now been out for 13 days. When they're out for 13 days, it's very hard to put back in. You can see that it's swollen, perhaps. He's tender over the ulnar side only of his wrist where his fracture is. The drudge is involved in pronation supination. The guy can pronate okay. He can't supinate at all. It's dislocated. So this is commonly missed. We don't examine the ulnar side of the wrist. You don't want patients to leave eMERGE with joints that aren't in place. Because the longer they're out, the harder it is to put back in. 48-year-old guy seen in our hospital fell skiing 10 days earlier in Quebec. Doesn't see anybody, comes to us day 10. Emerge doc sees him and diagnoses him. It's subtle, but there's a, radio, there's a proximal humerus fracture. Provides him with follow-up with ortho. Comes back to see ortho day 18. They repeat the x-ray. Proximal humerus fracture is fine. But when you throw that Y up, he's got a posterior sublux shoulder as well. That's a tough case. And when they do an axillary review to confirm it, if you've never seen an axillary review, this is the clavicle. His, his humeral head is off the glenoid. It's been out for how long? 18 days. It's very hard to reduce. Posterior shoulder locations are commonly missed. We need to have an approach to make sure we don't miss these sorts of things. Even simple things like a pulled elbow, like everybody wants to open a pulled elbow clinic, right? Like, everyone, oh, it's awesome, just put it back in. But a lot of times we sort of see a kid with an elbow, we may not take the history properly, we don't notice the kid, we don't try to pronate, supinate, notice they lack supination. X-ray's done, I'm not sure if there's an effusion, I don't want to miss a supracondylar. And if they come back to fracture clinic eight days later with a posterior slab on, their pulled elbow's been out for eight days. It's very hard to reduce a pulled elbow in the fracture clinic eight days out. Then the kid needs a general anesthetic, and if our orthopods can't put it back in on day eight, like in the, in, the, in the OR, they go down to sick kids for an open procedure, for a pulled elbow. So even a pulled elbow, which is a relatively benign thing, we all love seeing them, whatever, take a history, examine them. If you're worried it's a pulled elbow and you can't get it back in, take an x-ray, and if you still can't get it back in, you think it's a pulled elbow, have them seen the next day. Don't just put them in a sling, Tylenol, Advil, whatever, and have them seen the next day. Don't immobilize them in a posterior slab and have them followed up in a week. That's really tough on the kid's elbow. So prompt reduction really also implies prompt recognition. Why reduce it quickly? Well, there's a few things. Less pain. So just being nice and causing less pain is, is a good thing. If you have more stretch on the periosteum, if tissues are stretched, it hurts way more. And if you have an older patient, what do you do? You give them some narcotics. What do they get? They get sedated. What do they get? They get nauseous. What do they do? They vomit and they aspirate. And the treatment for it really is just to reduce it. So prompt reduction is really helpful to decrease their pain. Less swelling. For things like an ankle, the more it swells, the more difficult the operation is. So with swelling, you get more likely of an older patient to get secondarily opened, of a younger patient to get compartment syndrome, right? And just pain itself, even if you get neither of those, more swelling causes more pain. Pain's a muscle inhibitor. When patients are healing, they're going to move their fingers less. They're going to get more joint stiffness if it's delayed in reducing whatever their distal radius fracture is or whatever. So it's not that you've got to erase and do it in the next three minutes, but don't just put it off for hours and hours. 
try to get it reduced because reducing pain, reducing swelling, besides just being nice things, actually helps patients heal way better. Someone dislocates their knee, there's stretch on their popliteal artery. You just can't wait, right? These are, and a lot of these dislocations are actually pretty unstable and they're easy to reduce. Protect the cartilage. This is a really important reason why we're reducing things, right? So when it goes out, it can go out with a fair bit of force and there could be damage to the cartilage. There's nothing we can do about that. But we want to put it back in quickly. Prompt reduction helps to protect the cartilage. If somebody has a posterior hip dislocation, right, if it's a native hip, they're at risk of having avascular necrosis of their femoral head the longer it stays out. So you want to put this in as quickly as you can. It's an orthopedic emergency. Right? Don't get distracted by the hip. Sometimes there's a life-threatening injury too, like 40% of the time this is significant trauma. There's a life-threatening injury that takes precedence over this leg that looks really obvious. And you've got to find the head, neck, chest, abdo, pelvic injury, and then you can go look after this. This isn't even limb-threatening. It's not like they're going to lose their leg, but they're going to lose blood supply to their articular cartilage, which is a problem. If it's a prosthetic hip, there's no blood supply to titanium. Like, it's not the same urgency, but it still hurts. Right? But it's not an orthopedic emergency. So prompt reduction helps protect the cartilage. The other thing that helps protect cartilage is actually a gentle reduction. And you know, like for years, I just, like, as hard as I could shove the damn thing back in, hey, I got it, good for me, right? It's, it's not this sort of yank and shove approach. Think of what the, what the anatomy is, and then you can use a very nice sort of like a little tip and slide approach. And there are lots of ways that you can kind of achieve relaxation, because really that's all that you want. Once the muscles are relaxed, the reason you give sedation to patients for a dislocation is just to relax the muscles. But there are various ways to do it. The problem is all the patients have seen the YouTube videos. They've seen the redneck backyard reductions, right? Hey man, just have a couple more, I'll put my shoulder back in, right? And they think we're going to yank and pull, and you actually have to talk them down. So yeah, you can use medications, whether it be you know, a, an, an analgesic, like a you know, orally, you can give it IV, intranasally, IM, all kinds of stuff you can do. You can just do a block on the finger, do a digital block. So you can use pharmacologic agents. No question you can verbally talk patients into relaxation. If you're familiar with the Cunningham technique for shoulder dislocation, talking patients down and relax them is a really important thing. So sort of verbal analgesia, you know, really helps. And then we'll show you some positioning techniques of just putting the arm in a certain position, putting the ankle in a certain position, putting the leg when you're reducing the patella makes it a lot easier. Don't forget, neurovascular pre and post reduction. So very important to, to check and document. And this is one that we never do as generalists. We reduce a dislocation and then we don't touch it. And what does ortho want to know when you put something back in? Like, is it stable or not? And if you put something back in and it slips out really easy, it's unstable. You've got to protect it more. Either you mobilize it more than you normally would, or you get it seen faster than you normally would. But what we do is we don't touch it, because, geez, it might slip out again. But guess what? If it slips out easy, you'll slip it back in easy. But for 12 years, if I reduced a shoulder, reduced an elbow, reduced a patella, reduced a hip, don't touch a damn thing. It might go out again. And what does ortho want to know? Uh, will it go out again? So don't be afraid of trying that. I'm not saying for fractures. If you have a fracture, like a trimalleolar fracture, you don't have to check if it's stable or not. It's unstable, right? But for dislocations, you should check this if it's stable or not. And then protect it afterwards, however you need to protect it. If a guy dislocates his shoulder for the fifth time, because, oh man, I just put my shirt on, I forgot that's a, dislo that's, a, that's a loose shoulder, you can reduce it. They need nothing. You can put them in a the sling, go on your way, and go see a surgeon for an elective operation, right? If you have, you know, if it's first time traumatic playing, ba uh, whatever, basketball, football, external rotation, traumatic injury, 20-year-old guy, you put it back in, most will immobilize it for a couple few weeks, right, just to keep them quiet. So it all depends. So let's go through the cases. So if you dislocate your finger, dorsal PIP, 80% of them. This is a very common dislocation to see. Uh, if I saw this for the first, like, number of years, I'd just yank as hard as I could. And you know what? I'd win. I'm not a small guy, and I'd win. I'm like, damn it, man, even with a block, that's way more work than it should be. And then about seven or eight years ago, I read about this technique. And it was just sort of uh, an article on hand injuries or dislocations. I can't remember what it was. But the person just sort of described that if you pull on this thing, you get like the Chinese finger trap effect. The capsule gets tight. The extensor tendons, flexor tendons get tight. 
And when you push, pull on it really hard, what happens? You impede movement. And if you pull really hard and just try to yank it down, you can actually damage the cartilage as you put it back in. So instead of just yanking and pulling as hard as you can, which is what I did for years, it's like, just think of the anatomy. The base of the middle phalanx is concave. The head of the proximal phalanx is convex. And if you just tip up on the palmar side and then just slide it along, you basically just sort of tip up and slide it along. It just naturally wants to drop in. You're not pulling on it. You're not tensioning it. You just got to get them to relax. So you pull up, tip up on the palmar side. Your thumb is on the dorsal aspect of the, of the proximal phalanx. And what does it do? It just hits the base of the middle phalanx, and you just stretch it out. It's a tip and slide technique. So the patient's got this deformed finger. I'll, put, I'll give them a block before I send them to x-ray. I check their sensation. Good. I'll put marking in. And now the reduction. Can we have the audio on, if you don't mind? Perfect. I'm just relaxed. Oh. I'm just telling them to relax. Just it's relax. tense, even though it's blocked. Yeah. There you go. It's back in. That's it. Just relax. Now hold on for one second. And now you should yeah, check yeah, yeah. stability. Relax. You're all tense. Just relax your hands. Worst, <laughs> the worst is over. He's still worried. Good. It's stable. Good. Okay. Excellent. It's a boy. Congratulations. Right? <laughs> like it goes back in, right? And, it, and I never would have checked this before. But when you put a dislocation back in, just check if it's stable enough. If it slips out easy, guess what? Buddy taping's not enough. It'll slip out if they move it. Then you've got to formally immobilize it and hand it, up, hand it off to a hand specialist, right? Whoever looks after a hand where you are. But if it's stable, like the vast majority of them are, you can just buddy tape them and they don't have to see anybody. They'll be sore for weeks, they'll get swelling for a long time, but you know, a primary care doc can manage that. It doesn't have to get on a plane and go 400 kilometers to go see somebody. Volar P dislocations are very uncommon, less than 5%. Right? You could try the same technique. I've never actually seen one since I've learned the technique. You know, just flex it a little bit and try to, on the palmer side, see if you can slide it back in. But when you put it back in, regardless of whether it's stable or unstable, a volar PIP dislocation is a red flag because often they injure the central slip. And you won't be able to really chell and emerge. And if you don't recognize it, what happens is you take these, you say, oh, it feels stable. I'll just buddy tape them. And then what happens is they have a, the central slip injury, lateral bands drop down, and they get a boutonniere deformity. So if you ever see anybody with a volar PIP, it's a very uncommon injury, but when you immobilize it, it doesn't matter if it's stable or not. You need to formal, like, when you check it, it doesn't matter stable or not. You need to formally immobilize it and follow it up with a hand specialist, whoever looks after your hand in your area. One of the docs, when I was giving a talk, he said, oh, you know, there's a guy I play hockey with 20 years ago. The guy, his finger popped out. I popped it back in again. He said, what should I do now? I'm like, ah, you're fine. Go, let's keep playing. And they played. They, they played twice a week still. And the guy had a volar PIP, and he's got a boutonniere deformity for life. And he goes, every time I see the guy twice a week, I'm reminded that I screwed it up. And I said, you know what? You're reminded, but I don't know how many times I screwed it up in 12 years. Like, I never knew about it. Right? So volar PIPs are bad news. Case three. If you see this kid in sports, his patella is out, how many people would do an x-ray before they reduce a patella fracture? A patellar dislocation, rather. Like it looks like, right, like you don't need it. You know the diagnosis, right? How many people would routinely give, like try this without sedation? Excellent, me too, right? They come in, so a lot of times it slips and goes back in again. And they go, they got anterior knee pain, they felt something slip, you go, something slip, maybe it's your ACL, and we actually forget to check their patella. The typical story for patellar subluxation is they're flexed about 30 degrees, and they rotate, and they turn. And as they contract, it comes out laterally. Almost always, it comes out laterally. So you don't need an x-ray pre. You don't need sedation. What you need is muscle relaxation. So they come like this, right? Their, their, pillow, their knees are tied together with a couple of slings. They've got a pillow between their knees. They've been staring at their patella for 40 minutes, for an hour, right? And their, 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 their quads are like a rock. Just extend the knee. Just get them to relax. And if you straighten out their knee, that might be enough sometimes just to slip it in. But you just got to massage their quads. This is one of the docs. They asked me to do sedation, which we often don't do on these, but that's fine. So just sliding it over like this, not a good idea. You can damage the cartilage going back, right? Push down on the outside. And this isn't even that good a job, but it goes back. But if you try to just force it in, you can damage the cartilage, okay? So try to push down when you see this. 
the patella's out, push down on the lateral side of the patella that's out, once you've got the knee extended. What does that do? That tips up on the medial side. Now it's more likely to clear the lateral femoral condyle. Don't just try to jam the thing over. The goal is not just to reduce it. The goal is to reduce it without damaging the cartilage. And if this doesn't work, you've got the quads, you're trying to relax it, it still doesn't work, then passively, I will lift the patient's leg. So the patient's leg is being passively lifted. Rectus femoris is one of the quads muscles that originates above the hip. So when you flex the hip, you relax quads. So this is part of that little positioning stuff. And then I'll massage, massage, massage. I'll push down on the lateral side, try to tip it up medially, and then slide it over. The vast majority of time, this works. They don't need sedation. They need muscle relaxation and sometimes some positioning. Let's sort of see. If it's really swollen after, like, like, so, so you reduce it. How many people then post-reduction will take an x-ray? Okay, but it's back in, like you're pretty, you know it's in. So why are we taking an x-ray? Uh, I heard it say osteochondral fracture, excellent. If you see a big swollen knee afterwards, within an hour or two after an injury, that's blood. Patellar dislocation shouldn't cause blood unless you chip off a piece of bone. It used to be thought 5, 10% of the time, now with MR and scoping patients, like it's more, 40, 50, some studies say 70% of the time, you chip a piece of bone off the first time it dislocates. It could come off the inferior surface of the patella, it can come off the lateral femoral condyle. It can come off on the way out, it can go on the way in. If it happened on the way out, we can't do anything about it. On the way back in, we can try a gentle reduction and reduce that risk. So if you see a big swollen knee afterwards, take an x-ray, right? And don't just do AP lateral, do AP lateral, do obliques, do a skyline or sunrise, whatever your hospital calls it. Do an extra view looking for a little chip. A 17-year-old kid, he's, he follows up with me in the fracture clinic and this is his, that's his, look how swollen his knee is. A lot of them will say, oh, I had knee pain. You can just take their, take their patella and try to slide it out. And if they get apprehensive, oh, that's a positive apprehension sign. The kid probably subluxed his patella. But this case des definitely dislocated it. And the x-rays that were done post, again, they're not really projecting very well, but there's an osteochondral fracture. All you're seeing is the bony piece. It's not an avulsion. It's not soft tissue pulling it off. It's bone hitting bone and chipping off. And this is going to be a loose body floating around. And you, if you can look. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from the condyle? Usually it's off the patella. If it's off a weight-bearing surface and it's got a big piece of cartilage attached to it, the surgeons will want to put that back on. If it's not from a weight-bearing surface, they might just scope it out, because this is going to be a little loose body, causing intermittent locking of the guy's knee. So if you see a big swollen knee after a patella dislocation, take pictures. If you don't see it, they probably still damage it. You just don't see it on the x-ray. Again, very uncommon, not sure if it shows, but it's black on top, white on bottom. That's a lipohemarthrosis, uncommonly seen in a knee x-ray. If you ever see it, there has to be a fracture underneath it. The lipo, the fat, comes from marrow. Ankles. It's really important to understand. If you see tenting of the skin, reduce it. They're so unstable. Right? 45-year-old guy. Why does this, like, there's a lateral malfracture. There's no medial malfracture, but it's shifted. Right? This is subluxed. There's the posterior malleolus of a trimalleolar fracture. If you look carefully, there's a tall, on the lateral view, there's a long spike of a fibula. Always trace out the fibula on the lateral view. Sometimes it's the only view where you see a fracture. But this absolutely has to be reduced, not just to reduce pain, reduce swelling, secondary open, but pre-op swelling ankle-wise, it's imperative to reduce the swelling. Why? Because if it's really swollen, when they go and cut, it's like putting dirt out of a hole. You can't put it back in again. And if you then can't put the dirt, if you can't put it back in again, and you know, you're dissecting planes in there that's gonna cause more edema, they end up can't close the skin. And then what happens is you've got to put skin graft over an area of poor blood supply with metal underneath it. They're a sitting duck for an infection. If it swells more, they get blisters. Blisters like a dermal injury, right? So then they're not going to want to operate. So now they delay operating. But if they already put the patient to sleep and only now they take the splint off and they see it, that's a problem. The other thing that's really important in terms of protecting the cartilage, you have to recognize, that's the distal tibia that's just grinding on the Taylor Dome. And the Taylor Dome is a weight-bearing surface. The talus is the scaphoid of the ankle. It's got terrible blood supply. There's no muscle that attaches to it. Two-thirds of the surface is covered by articular cartilage, so no blood comes that way, right? And it's very high risk of having problems. Like a talus, Taylor fractures are terrible at healing because of their blood supply. And if this is left for a couple few hours, 
with just the distal tibia grinding on it, they're going to have an articular defect. That's a weight-bearing surface. Every time you take a step, 85% of your weight goes through your Taylor dome. And if there's articular defect, they're going to get arthritis. And by you reducing it, it's going to make a huge difference. You know, they come in, EMS has put them in the splint, totally appropriate for EMS to put them in the splint. But if you didn't put the splint on, you got to look down at skin the first time you see the patient, because this patient's got, looks, there's a little tenting right there. And if you leave this for a few hours, it'll swell and it'll become secondarily open. So this patient actually gets reduced without x-rays. The merge dot does a sedation, but no x-ray. We kind of know it's out. Turn it back in place. And it's so unstable, you'll see how easy it goes in. Just hold on a second. Let me just, uh, just, just hold on a second. Yeah. Okay. So he flexes the knee to relax gastrox. This makes it easier to do ankle there reductions. So now you're going to hold it. And now just grab it by the big toe. These fractures are almost always out laterally, almost always out posteriorly. When you grab the big toe, you're bringing it in and up. You're preventing it from slipping back out again, and now you can pat it up, and you're out of the way. So have your assistant just grab the big toe. Get your slabs ready. It's easier to put the U slabs on first because they don't work so much against gravity. And then you can put the posterior slab on afterwards. Make sure, his arm's in the way here, you've got to leave a channel, a big channel down the middle. Why? Because it's going to swell. You don't want a circumferential cast. Also because when this patient goes to the OR and they take it off, if it's circumferential, the surgeons have to use a cast saw. And now you get cast dust in an OR where you're doing an open reduction. They hate that. It increases the risk of infection. So never put anything circumferential. Make sure there's a channel down the middle. Then put the posterior slab. Plaster sticks better to plaster. So it's better to put the posterior slab on second. And now you just wrap it up. And if, even if it's hanging down, you can still sort of cheat as you come around. And then mold it. Where was the fracture? It was out. Where, what did you do? You reduced it. Where does it want to go? Back out. Just take your hands and just mold it into inversion just to hold it in position. Then you do a post-reduction x-ray. If you did a pre, that's fine. But you don't have to delay. You don't need the x-ray to say that that's a bad ankle injury. You can reduce them without the x-ray. I've done a number of them. I just take the patients and I just sit them over the side of the bed. Now their knee is flexed and you can get them reduced. And what the patients say with tib-fib fractures, with ankle fractures, is thank you because it hurts so much the stretch on the periosteum. It feels so much better when the bone's back in. So make sure you recognize jo uh, joints that aren't properly aligned. Reduce them promptly. Protect the cartilage. It's really what the goal is, because if they have articular damage, they're going to get arthritis down the road. Relaxation's the key. It could be through medications. It could be through just verbal analgesia. Positioning really helps as well. Don't be afraid to check stability afterwards. And then once it's back in and you think it's stable, you decide how you want to protect it. Don't memorize what to do. Think of what the patient's injury is and then understand how bad it is. You know, if it's not a, oh, it's just a finger, but it's unstable, boy, that makes you more worried. Right? All these sorts of things. And as you think about each case, you're not memorizing what to do, but you're sort of understanding. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to all my friends back in North York. For that.